Welcome everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen and I'm the Executive Director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's talk is entitled Genetic Discrimination, Exploring the Echoes Between Nazi and American Eugenic Histories, featuring our guest speaker, Tiara Masnick, PhD candidate and teaching associate at the University of Massachusetts at, Massachusetts at Amherst. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, psychological, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and Indigenous communities. Today's event is part of the 2023-24 Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center and National Endowment for the Humanities Colloquium entitled Weaponizing the Past, Art, History, and the Rhetoric of National Greatness. The event is organized today by the KHC and co-sponsored by the Holocaust Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College, the Ray Walpole Institute for the Study of Holocaust Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, the Nancy and David Wolf Holocaust and Humanity Center in Cincinnati, the Holocaust and Human Rights Center in White Plains, and the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University. Now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming this year's KHC NEH Faculty Fellows, Dr. Kathleen Alves and Dr. Lisa Atik. Dr. Kathleen Tamayo Alves is Associate Professor and Deputy Chair of English at Queensborough Community College. Her research centers on 18th century literature and culture, medicine, and literary history, and she has recently published in Studies in 18th Century Culture, 18th Century Fiction, Afroben Online, and The Rambling. Her forthcoming book, Body Language, Medicine and the 18th Century Comic Novel, explores how medicine shaped and is shaped by comic language through fictional dram dramatizations of female-specific medical phenomena, such as menstruation, hysteria, and pregnancy. Dr. Elisa Atik is Associate Professor of English at Queensborough Community College. She focuses on the discourses of power, violence, and marginalization. She has published on the functioning of affect and emotion in Israeli cinema and on the pedagogy of teaching about mass violence and genocide. Dr. Atik co-organized the 2016-17 KHC NEH colloquia entitled Fleeing Genocide, Displacement, Exile, and the Refugee, as well as was a participant in the 2019 United States Holocaust Memorial Museum faculty seminar entitled Disability, Eugenics, and Genocide, Nazi Germany, Its Antecedents and Legacy. Dr. Atik teaches classes on literature of the Holocaust, popular culture and literary theory, along with multiple composition courses, and she is currently one of QCC's representatives to the CUNY LGBTQIA Council. Dr. Alves, Dr. Atik, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. We thank you for your attendance for today's event, the fifth in our, in our colloquium titled Weaponizing the Past, Art History and the Rhetoric of National Greatness. As a series, we aim to understand how nostalgia, narrative, and what Walter Benjamin referred to as an aestheticizing of political life functioned in the Nazi state. We also look at contemporary movements that use idealized and often fictional pasts to justify exclusionary ideologies and the ramifications for those who don't conform to these romanticized national histories. Today's event will focus on Adolf Hitler's establishment of the Involuntary Euthanasia Program in 1939, codenamed Axion T Form, empowering medical personnel throughout the Third Reich to sterilize and kill those considered unworthy of life. The Nazi racial hygiene of Axion T Four was inspired by the American eugenicist movement of the early 20th century. Considering themselves as part of the American elite, eugenicists described socially worthless and the ancestrally unfit as bacteria, vermin, mongrels, and subhuman. In their view, 
a superior race of Nordics was seen as the answer to the globe's eugenic problems. U.S. laws, eugenic investigations, and ideology became the map for Germany's rising tide of race biologists and scientific racism. In fact, Hitler read eugenic textbooks as a young corporal in 1924 and even wrote fan mail to Leon Whitney, president of the American Eugenic Society, and to Madison Grant, who published on the corruption of the Nordic race by Jews, Black Americans, Slavs, and others. In his book, The Passing of the Great Race, Grant wrote, mistaken regard for what we are believed to be divine laws and a sentimental belief in the sanctity of human life tend to prevent both the elimination of defective infants and the sterilization of such adults as are themselves of no value to the community. The laws of nature require the obliteration of the unfit and human life is valuable only when it is of use to the community or race. Hitler closely followed American eugenic legislation. Citing the laws of heredity promoted by American eugenicists, he was convinced that a nation could prevent unhealthy and disabled beings from being born. He would determine which peoples would be of no value or injurious to the racial stock. In the early years of the Third Reich, Hitler and his race hygienists designed eugenic legislation modeled on American laws upheld by the Supreme Court, including the infamous Buck versus Bell decision of 1927, which was decided for forced sterilization in an institutional setting yeah. and with the infamous yeah. remarks from then Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. that three generations of imbeciles are enough. The Nazi party's series of racial hygiene did not then come in a vacuum, yeah. but from the successful of sterilization laws in the United States, which by the time the scientific community began to condemn eugenical sterilization, had performed over 60,000 of such forced procedures almost entirely on low-income and black and brown peoples, particularly those confined to institutional settings. The Nazi program resulted in the sterilization of 360,000 to 375,000 persons. In 1939, two years before the official implementation of the final solution, the party started the euthanasia program Actian T4 to systematically murder institutionalized patients with disabilities in Germany. Beginning with health screenings of infants and children who were then sent to special wards where they were murdered, often by overdoses or starvation, and then expanding to younger adults in institutional settings, Actian T4 eventually expanded to six different gassing facilities for adults and was maintained in various guises throughout the war, ultimately leading to killing of over 250,000 people. The purpose of this program was to restore the racial integrity of the nation, by eliminating people who had psychiatric, neurological, or physical disabilities and functioned parallel to the systemic murder of Jews, Roma, and other Nazi victims who were viewed as antithetical to the identity of the Nazi state. And now Dr. Eliza Atik will introduce our speaker, Tiara Masnick. Hi all, thank you for being here. Um, our speaker, Tiara Masnick, MA, is a PhD candidate in German and Scandinavian studies and an instructor in women Gender and Sexuality Studies at the U University of Massachusetts at Amherst. As a scholar of reproduction under Nazism, she researches sterilization, eugenics, and pronatalism during and after the Holocaust. Her work appears in the, Ma in the Massachusetts Review, Feminist German Studies, the German Review, and soon the Journal on the, of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences. She will be defending her dissertation in German studies this spring. Professor Masnick, welcome. I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Let's see here, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Good afternoon, folks. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you for attending my talk today. And I'd like to extend a special thanks to both the Queensboro Community College and the Harriet and Kenneth Kupferberg Holocaust Center. Another special thanks to the National Endowment for the Humanities, in addition to the generous sponsors that have made today's talk possible. This afternoon, I'll be presenting some of the eugenic divergences and resonances between American and German eugenic histories. First, I begin by introducing some of the pillars of Nazi medicine, as well as some terminology, after which I trace the contours of the euthanasia and sterilization programs as practiced in Nazi Germany. 
Lastly, I speak to some of the Holocaust comparisons that are invoked in reproductive politics, modeled by how we can tell these histories in more complex and nuanced ways. I'd like to preface today's talk with a small anecdote from my own experience. While guiding a class discussion on victim groups in a Holocaust survey course three years ago, one student quickly unmuted her Zoom during COVID times and pausing before the camera, uh, claimed that abortion is an ongoing Holocaust. The procedure, when performed on grounds of fetal anomaly, she claimed, was a present form of the Nazis' T4 euthanasia program. I was surprised that such comparisons still existed, but it was a stark reminder for me that this presentation and these histories continue to impact our realities. So the new role that, that especially characterized Nazi medicine was defined by collective national interests that superseded that of the patient. Denying a citizen the ability to procreate, for instance, was prized over the patient's hopes for reproduction or family building. Similarly, an individual's right to life was denied in the presupposed interest of the nation. If an individual were placed at the bottom of the regime's evaluative hierarchy, then serving the nation meant capitalizing on this hierarchy, including via human experimentation. Given the eugenic interventions of the regime, physicians were positioned as pioneers for medical and scientific progress in the name of the nation. Germany had been, up until this point in time, a pioneer in medical scientific research, from sexology to hormones, from genetics to gynecology, from psychoanalysis to biomedical engineering. German sciences established themselves as world-renowned merit that the regime sought to continue at the expense of those at the bottom of this evaluative hierarchy. As can be surmised from this context, there were very little restrictions on medicine when conducted in pursuit of national interests. When medical researchers such as Karl Klauberg and affiliates stated that there was a shortage of lab animals for human experimentation or that such lab animals reacted differently than humans, the permissibility of human experimentation was not in question. Rather, the cost, number of subjects, and location was to be discussed. The medical experiments in the concentration camps elucidate these new roles and priorities of medicine under the regime. Procedures, the procedures that have been conceptualized in scholarship um, in terms of human experimentation under the regime are generally classif classified in three categories. The first being racial science, such as the sterilization experiments of Karl Klauberg and Horst Schumann. Two, military innovation. This was, for instance, the hypothermia and high altitude experiments that were meant to further benefit the German military in times of war. And three, personal research agendas. This was best exemplified, for instance, by Josef Mengele's twin experiments. It's important to note the terminology used here, which is that the collective was meant to be the Nazi state. The state, however, was no neutral apparatus. As a product of design, the regime sought to align race and space, much like how they pursued land and resources in the East. Now I'd like to look at some of the terminology for today's talk for those who may not be deeply familiar. So eugenics are in long and short, <laughs> very simply and superficially put, reproductive control of who should or should not be reproducing. Generally, this is conceived as positive eugenics or measures that promote reproduction and negative eugenics, the measures that discourage reproduction. Um, and as you can see here in this table, there are also soft and hard measures for each of these. So for context for today's talk, we'll be speaking about sterilization and murder, both of which fall under hard versions of negative eugenics. So the euthanasia program was the first to kill German civilians during the Nazi regime. Beginning in 1939, this was nearly two years before the gas vans in Kelmno. And here the regime targeted those with disabilities who were prone to lifelong institutionalization, 
In contrast to those eligible for sterilization who could largely lead lives independently outside of state institutions, or most importantly, were able to labor, those who required additional supports were treated as societal burdens or ballasts and killed. The first stage of the euthanasia program um, targeted children with disabilities. Beginning in October 1939, parents were told that their child with special needs would be sent to a specialized pediatric center, after which the children were either lethally overdosed or starved to death. While young children under the age of two were initially the intended targets, this brought in to include all youth. It's estimated that in this initial period, eight to 10,000 disabled children were killed. Emboldened after the success of the pediatric murders, the regime then turned to adults with disabilities. The program entitled T4 pioneered this effort. The staff of T4, short for the address of the facility, Tiergartenstrasse 4, distributed surveys to state institutions such as hospitals, health officials, um, um, mental institutions, nursing homes, and the regime then used this information on, on its surface provided for statistical purposes to or orchestrate the murder of adults with disabilities. It enabled them through these surveys to establish uh, racial categorization and most importantly, the potential for future laboring. Once the lists were generated, an individual would be transported from their state facility via gray bus to an institution where they would be gassed. The buses that picked up prisoners, or what would soon be victims of the euthanasia program, they were picked up by gray buses. Nearby cremation facilities then picked up the ashes and sent them to loved ones, accompanied by a falsified death certificate listing natural causes for the individual's death. While the program itself was secret, results quickly revealed themselves. Over 70,000 adults were sent to one of these six state institutions and gassed. While the T4 program was closed due to public backlash after 70,000 loved ones never returned home, the killing continued nevertheless. It's important to keep in mind that public perception was deeply important to the regime. Um, the regime would, in practice, push its limits, wait for public response, and only then continue. Children were still euthanized, and the murder of adults reverted to original methods of killing, lethal overdose and starvation. Many of these state facilities, instead of sending out individuals to the six gassing centers as had been practiced in the previous stage, they instead killed patients on site via starvation and lethal overdose. As you can see here on this map, there were six gassing stations, and there were continuities between the sterilization and euthanasia programs. Horst Schumann, for instance, was a, um, a facility administrator at Grafenek, and he later pioneered the radiation sterilization experiments at Auschwitz-Birkenau. The law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring was passed within six months of Hitler being appointed chancellor. It was one of the initial acts that the regime took within the first year of terror. Alongside the Reichstag fire, the Enabling Act, book burnings, anti-Jewish boycott, and the raid of Magnus Hirschfeld's Institute for Sexual Sciences. Under the aegis of this 1933 law, the regime authorized the sterilization of between 350,000 and 450,000, quote, Aryans suffering from both hereditary and purportedly genetic conditions. The medical conditions under which the procedure was warranted were, one, any hereditary disease that could be transmitted to one's kin that could result in physical or mental impairment, Two, congenital mental deficiencies, schizophrenia, manic depressive insanity, hereditary epilepsy, hereditary chorea, hereditary blindness, hereditary deafness, 
any severe hereditary deformity, and lastly, alcoholism. Important to note here is that the congenital mental deficiency was for all intents and purposes a blanket term. Those considered asocial, for instance, encompassed anyone non-socially conforming. This included initially, before later legislation, Sinti and Roma. This also included lesbians, the poor, unemployed, sex workers, single mothers, and the homeless. There's even an instance of a woman who, as a teenager, stole a bicycle and was met with forcible sterilization under the regime under the pretense of being asocial. It was ultimately unclear what could be genetically inherited, and Nazi eugenicists preferred to err on the side of caution. With the rediscovery of Gregor Mendel's theories of inheritance, the body became an illegible site of danger. What could appear within later generations, for instance, was unknown and therefore dangerous. Oh, let me go back for one moment. So the, the vast majority of sterilization victims were subjected to the procedure before the onset of the war, at, wh at which point medical facilities, personnel, and funding were required elsewhere for the war effort. By 1937, so within four years, it's estimated that the bulk, 285,000 people, had already been sterilized. In the first two years of the legislation, nearly 2,000 individuals died the majority of whom were women. Hysterectomies, the only foolproof method of sterilization for women, left them vulnerable to sepsis and ultimately led to death, predominantly of women. Once this became public knowledge, the regime opted for less invasive measures, such as tubal ligation. So the key features to Nazi medicine, in addition to the tenets I previously highlighted, are its centralized nature and ubiquitous implementation. The efficacy of the sterilization and euthanasia programs demanded a centralized social system of care. Here I model how social care networks forced cooperation from individuals at all levels of the social ladder at the risk of arrest or other violent reprisals. Here you can see that if someone was impacted by any of the aforementioned medical conditions, they could be reported and streamlined through the sterilization process. Individuals could be nominated for sterilization by anyone, though this was demanded via an Anzeige, a mandatory report for those in state-funded positions and social care positions. All reports were sent to the public health officer, the Amstarzt. Here you can see that a number of professionals were mandated reporters, so doctors, medical assistants, practitioners, dentists, caretakers, even masseuses. They were all required, if they encountered a patient who met any of this criteria, they were required to report them. Similarly, parents and caregivers could also, in theory, um, report, say, a child. This was not often the case. Um, in fact, in my work in the archives, I've discovered that um, by far and large, fathers advocated for their female daughters and hoped to hide them. And it was at the threat of arrest that many of them ended up um, allowing their child to be taken for sterilization. The Amstarzt would then um, be summoned to a hereditary health court after a very brief period, sometime as, sometimes as short as two weeks. Um, a cornerstone of this process was also the medical exam required by the courts. People could be questioned on family history, and most, if not all, were subject to intelligence testing. Um, some of these tests may have resembled what we see now as IQ tests, but a large portion of them um, analyzed if a patient had social knowledge. So this included national history, folk tales, folk songs, um, a number of things. Once summoned to the court, the individuals could opt for a lawyer, but this was challenging. Lawyers were costly. They could only be men, and 
the lawyer did not have any access to the documents being used against the individual. Having their, um, having their client's medical record for their defense, the state claimed would be akin to working against the regime. Women were also not allowed to speak in court. Adjudicating were generally three judges, all of whom belonged to the party, and two of whom were Nazi physicians, sometimes the same ones who administered the aforementioned intelligence testing. In 95% of the hearings, the court decided in favor of sterilization. Appeals resulted in an equally high rate of sterilization. An individual would be notified that they have X amount of days to report to a nearby hospital and submit to the procedure. If the individual refused, armed police would appear at their doorstep and coerce their transport to the hospital. In such cases of refusal, individuals were supplied with the bill for their sterilization in the mail after the fact. It's worth noting that while men and women were sterilized in equal number, the ground for sterilization was deeply gendered. Sex workers, single mothers, lesbian women, for instance, were punished with sterilization in ways that differed from, for instance, men's unemployment or perceived criminal recidivism. Eugenic measures were implemented ubiquitously by the regime. While public aspects of life remained public, the private also became subject to the public and therefore the state. So to say all matters of human life were forcibly rendered visible, documentable, and observable by the regime. Correspondingly, the regime's programs were multi-pronged and far-reaching in practice. Murder, for instance, understood as the farthest end of the eugenic spectrum was omnipresent. Jews and Sinti and Roma were subject to fatal conditions in ghettos, transports, pogroms, and camps, if not killed outright in any one of these locations. Those considered, quote, Aryan could be killed during sterilization, could be subjected to euthanasia, while those considered political opponents could die at any point of imprisonment, whether in political prisons or in concentration camps. Here I'd like to present the omnipresent, omnipresent or ubiquitous nature of the regime's sterilization programs, experimental and otherwise. In addition to the thousands of sterilizations conducted under the 1933 legislation, an additional 385 mixed-race children from the Rhineland were sterilized quietly in 1937. They claimed that Black ancestry was a danger and a shame to Aryan racial purity. Racial mixing was a core fear of the regime to which ends charges of racial defilement were similarly grounds for sterilization. Those convicted of sexual crimes, including racial defilement and homosexuality, were subject to forcible sterilization. Jewish men, con Jewish men convicted of having sex with Aryan women, in addition, in addition to homosexual men, were both at risk of castration. Though sterilization had already been enforced through a network of centralized state machinery and mandatory reporting, the regime sought refinement of this procedure for wider application in the Generalplan Ost, or for the Plan for the East, for Eastern Territories. They sought to establish a method of low-cost, discrete mass sterilization, and they capitalized on the centralization of human material and financed the experimental sterilizations of Jewish men and women by Horst Schumann and Karl Klauberg at Auschwitz-Birkenau between 1942 and 1944. Later, fleeing from impending Russian forces and a contracting Reich, Klauberg fled to Ravensbrück women's concentration camp, where he implemented and routinized his intrauterine method of transcervical sterilization on an indefinite number of Sinti and Roma women and girls, estimated between two and 400. Parallel to this, camps all over the, the Nazi-occupied Nazi territories conducted sterilizations on a spectrum of prisoners in their respective medical facilities under the aegis of the aforementioned 1933 legislation. While Sinti and Roma were subject to sterilization under the law as being asocial, 1942 marked the implementation of the Auschwitz Erlass, a decree that positioned individuals to choose either sterilization or imprisonment in Auschwitz. 
The regime's sprawling sterilization programs operated without limit in Nazi-occupied territories, including Hungary and the Netherlands. In the former, the Lovara, Romani, and Lachenbach camp were subject unknowingly to experimental sterilizations between 1940 and 1945, while the latter presented Jewish individuals of mixed marriages a similar quandary to that of the Auschwitz Elas, sterilization or deportation. I should mention that the research on the sterilization in the Hungarian camp Lachenbach is forthcoming by Alexandra Szabo, Szabo at Brandeis University. So, in the current historical moment, we're inundated by references, allusions, and comparisons to the Holocaust. In the past couple of years alone, those labeled anti-vaxxers have compared themselves to Jewish Holocaust victims, likening the yellow star to an empty vaccination card. Curiously, this transpired during the same time in which US, former U.S. President Donald Trump was likened to Hitler in left-wing media. Most recently, it was Russia's President Vladimir Putin who claimed that Nazis continue to live in Ukraine while, ironically, his military violence has pushed surviving Holocaust victims to flee. Meanwhile, objectors to the war have manufactured a cover on Time magazine in which a torn cover revealed a mustache, a Nazi mustache above Putin's upper lip. As one can imagine, both the ends and middles of the political spectrum are guilty of partaking in this invocation. In short, the abuses and misuses of the Nazi past are quite ubiquitous and continue to proliferate. The pitfalls here are that it relativizes the Holocaust and removes all nuance and context. It's also weaponized by political groups to further an agenda, no matter what that be on either side of any political spectrum. So some historical context of comparison. Oops, excuse me. There we go. Bear with me here. So the context of comparison, here we go. Anti-abortion advocates have long compared abortion to the Holocaust, both in the US and in Europe. Here on the left-hand side, you see a protester holding a doll and brandishing a sign that places an SS skeleton alongside a reproductive choice advocate. Especially relevant here are the 2019 comments made by um, US Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. In a decision delivered for Box versus Planned Parenthood of Indiana and Kentucky, Thomas stated that permitting abortion would be tantamount to, quote, modern day eugenics. But as reproductive scholar Dorothy, Robert points, Dorothy Roberts points out, we can and should condemn eugenics. But what's important to dif differentiate is that eugenic laws passed in the early, early 20th century relied on coerced sterilization, not abortion, to regulate devalued populations. Such laws are actually similar to today's abortion bans. Both seek to control reproductive decision-making for repressive political ends. On the right-hand side, you can see one of the many graphics that now depict Donald Trump alongside or resembling Adolf Hitler. Many of the comments made that compare the two vis-a-vis -vis sterilizations in Georgia's ICE facility have since been deleted after Elon Musk purchased Twitter, now known as X. Yep, excuse me. Here we go. So, modeling complex continuities. So in contrast to the superficial comparisons between the US and Germany made to further political arguments or stances, I'd like to present a more complex and nuanced model that highlights the continuities, divergences, echoes, and residues between these two historic periods. So we'll first begin with California. So as Stefan Kuhl's scholarship has illuminated for us, eugenicists in the US and Germany exchanged ideas, experiments, findings, and collegiality with one another. 
California, as you may know, was the model from which Nazi Germany modeled their own sterilization programs. Leading U.S. eugenicists Paul Popineau and Ezra Gosney both regularly corresponded with German eugenicists and exchanged their publications, statistics, protocols. And once Germany implemented their 1933 legislation, the two even went so far as to defend it, stating it was, quote, not a hasty improvisation, but the product of years of research and practice. Both in the United States and in Germany, the turn of the century had been met with anxiety regarding public health and urbanization, decreasing birth rates, and shifting social roles. Though eugenic sterilizations first began in the U.S. and in Indiana in 1907 in an attempt to curb sexual deviance in young boys, it was in California that they came to proliferate. The 1909 law permitted sterilization of those labeled, quote, mentally retarded, as well as prison inmates. Four years later marked a broadening of the law. Those considered, quote, insane or manic or afflicted with dementia were also eligible. And beginning in 1917, only eight years after California per passed its first law, this came to encompass anyone that was considered abnormal. Lic licentiousness, sexual activity, delayed marriage, and fewer births led many to fear that Women's sexual activity in particular was disrupting the family unit and therefore social cohesion, casting women as abnormal if they did not adhere to social conventions or expectations. Unlike in Germany, where social decline or quote, degeneration led many to believe that sterilization of the unfit would be the solution, it did not take the overtly gendered nature as it did in California. As Michel Foucault has demonstrated, initial sterilizations drew upon the, quote, leper model. Much like those afflicted by leprosy were removed and isolated from the general population, women were removed from this general population and detained in California state facilities. They were unsure if social nonconformity or sexual proclivities were contagious. Met with these unknowns, women were removed and kept in these state facilities. Though in light of mounting costs, administrators opted instead for the, quote, contagion model. Hoping to prevent any transmission of deviance to offspring, women were instead sterilized and released, even though some eugenicists feared that it would embolden women to have more sex faced with, quote, no reproductive consequences. Together, facility administrators and eugenicists advocated for sterilization legislation that codified the procedure. By 1933, when the Nazi regime came into power, California had already sterilized 8,500 individuals. Important to note here conceptually is that by locating social ills in the human body, social change was posited via bodily intervention. So 1945 precipitated great changes in eugenics in the United States. Eugenic sterilizations were thought to be a thing of the past associated with the Nazi regime. The Holocaust, in the words of Liddell McWhorter, sullied the bathwater for eugenicists. Those who had advocated for sterilization then pivoted into pronatalist measures, promoting marital counseling and marriage fitness. By inserting, inserting positive eugenic messaging into television and magazines, the negative Nazi-based connotations were removed, even though marriage counseling itself was a product of German pronatalism of the 1920s. State institutions and facilities, however, continued to sterilize predominantly women of color across the United States. Unlike Germany's centralized medical and social systems, that in the U.S. was less centralized and coordinated. Instead, each state and region continued their own iteration of sterilization that took the shape of its own landscape. This is also an obstacle for researchers as any singular history will suffer from overgeneralization. Here you can see that eugenesis um, that promoted pronatalism continued to do so after 1945, and the eugenesis who had promoted sterilization pivoted into positive eugenics. The facilities, however, that had paired with these eugenicists 
continued to sterilize, though on different populations. After 1945, we see predominantly women of color being impacted. So American medicine imagined that it was emerging from the Holocaust scot-free. Nazi medicine, American doctors believed, used race for repressive purposes rather than, quote, legitimate uses in science. Meanwhile, Jim Crow laws had opened the doors of state institutions in the South. Medical facilities came to host coercive sterilizations then with alarming frequency. Some notable sterilization programs in the U.S. include North Carolina, where Black men and women receiving social services were targeted, Black single mothers in particular were asked to sign a consent form for sterilization in exchange for social services, without which they would be denied housing, food, and the means to live. In Mississippi, Black women were sterilized while under anesthesia for other medical procedures. Famous civil rights advocate Fannie Lou Hamer, for instance, was sterilized against her knowledge while under anesthesia for a uterine tumor. The procedure was so frequent, Hamer nicknamed the procedure the Mississippi appendectomy. In Puerto Rico, poor women were sterilized at astounding rates. It's estimated that a third of the women of reproductive age were sterilized. It became so common, it became known as the procedure. In Arizona, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and South Dakota, tens of thousands of indigenous women were sterilized in state-run Indian health services. Living up to its reputation, California continued to lead the nation in eugenic sterilizations after 1945, though it predominantly came to target poor women, Latin women, and women of color. The era of sterilizations post-1945 came to a halt in the 1970s, and for a few central reasons. Firstly, American biologists came to surface the connection between the U.S. eugenics movement and Nazis linking the two in unsavory ways that evoked the word genocide and Holocaust. Moreover, it was during the 1970s that people began to critically examine Cold War anxieties and the war in Vietnam, among other periods of America's questionable past. Secondly, civil rights advocates and Black nationalist movements began to speak openly about the sterilization of Black populations, such as, for instance, as Fannie Lou Hamer did. As Angela Davis has aptly articulated, prisons have become receptacles for obsolete practices, including sterilization. California's prisons permitted for the unauthorized sterilization of 144 women with state funds between 2006 and 2010. Under the false diagnoses of cancer or uterine tumors, many of these procedures were done without consent under anesthesia or with consent under the pretense of these conditions. Predominantly Black and Latin women were sterilized. On the left here, you can see Kelly Dillon advocating for the abolishment of sterilization in prisons. She herself was sterilized in California's prisons. And in 2021, carceral sterilizations resurfaced here in Irwin County's ICE facility in Georgia. Here, nurse Dawn Wooten states women were coerced to sign for their sterilization at the risk of having water, electricity, and food withheld. Others were not provided with proper interpreters, while others were told they had medical conditions such as cancer or tumors that necessitated the procedure, though this was without basis. The performing doctor who conducted these sterilizations was henceforth nicknamed the uterine, excuse me, the uterus collector. So this is the case of Ashley X. This became famous in 2006 after she was sterilized with her parents' permission, um, but bypassing state regulations. Um, they contended that it was part and parcel of growth attenuation therapy in which a child's growth is stunted in the interest of caregivers. Here, her parents claimed that it would help them maneuver her more easily which allowed her higher participation in social activities, family events, um, and that it would prevent her from experiencing the discomfort of menstruation without mention of the discomfort of a hysterectomy. 
um, and that it would it would rob her of sexuality that may have a certain impact on future caregivers. There are continuities and divergences between these histories and eugenic programs, and these details demand our parsing. While evaluative hierarchies and proposed methods of bodily intervention were sentiments shared both in the US and in Nazi Germany, the elision of these two misrepresents American eugenicists and doctors, but moreover, it prevents our ability to recognize contemporary authoritarian tendencies and the enduring influence of biological determinism in American culture. Moreover, this elision of the two can position eugenicists and race scientists as an aberration of the time when it was in fact common practice. In the context of the US, this comparison distances us from the pressing matter of carceral justice and disability justice. While these histories enjoyed certain intersections, enjoyable at the time, their afterlives were shaped by dis disparate contexts, populacies, violence, and racial divides. In the United States, eugenic sterilization persevered on women of color in state institutions operating on a decentralized social system. And even euthanasia, while discussed vehemently by eugenicists in the 1930s, never garnered any widespread consensus. Thank you so much for this talk, and I welcome any questions that you might have for me. Um, thank you so much, Professor Messick. That was a wonderful talk. I'm really happy to have you here. Um, so we invite everybody now to submit questions. Um, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, I see some questions already in there. Um, and uh, I'm going to open it up now. And I hope the questions continue to come in um, as we have our conversations. Um, uh, so a question, one of the questions I see here um, is about how it's... Um, affected the bodies, uh, particularly the bodies of women of color who were forcibly sterilized. Um, is that something that you could perhaps speak to a bit? Um, sure. In in the context of both the U.S. and Germany, um, there have been long-lasting repercussions, which have been exacerbated by the denial of, of the nature of these procedures, that they were eugenic, and by the delay in survivors receiving any sort of compensation or apologies. Um, in North Carolina, it wasn't until relatively recently within the past couple decades that um, folks received reparations for the procedures, but um, it, I mean, it, it upended people's lives. Um, Ann Cooper Hewitt, she was a very wealthy woman um, in California, and there were certain political dynamics to her sterilization, but um, it, it definitely impacted women for the long term, and especially in communities where reproduction was prized. Um, that meant that social cohesion and integration was deeply impacted, um, as well as ideas of gender. If, if, reproduc if reproducing meant being a woman, um, then the inability to reproduce reflect prompted women to reflect on their own womanhood. Question about why specifically um, people with disabilities were targeted um, for mm -hmm. these eugenic processes? Yes. Um, so everything in terms of disability had to do with state funding. There were also ideas of what made a life worthy. And that was deeply dictated by capitalist and laboring abilities. So someone that was permanently uh, institutionalized or unable to labor, quote unquote, with the normal population um, would be seen as a burden, an extra mouth to feed. This first became strong rhetoric during World War I in Germany. Um, and so after the war, in the face of losing World War I, um, uh, there were certain rhetoric that really targeted those with disabilities, saying we were feeding these useless eaters um, while those on the war front weren't receiving the support that they quote needed. Um, but I, it, it's a combination of interest in preserving state funds, but also in who should be able to reproduce. It's a it's a engineering and a puppeteering of the present that looks towards the future. And in the case of sterilization, it's an 
intervention in the present to prevent something in the future from happening, whereas with euthanasia, it was someone um, robbed the ability to live in the present. So there's also a temporal di dimension to this. I think that uh, poses really interesting reflections on the current American um, practices of forced sterilization um, that I, I think lends itself to this uh, question as well. Right. What, to what framework are we positioning certain people and certain identities as uh, not requiring futurity? Yes. Yeah. And only a few years ago, Germany had attempted to pass legislation that um, to save state money, those with physical disabilities, instead of receiving funded care in their homes or on site or in schools, would be forced to live in care facilities. Um, and there was great backlash from a great number of people, and it never progress any further, um, but it's still definitely a relevant matter at hand, the, the topic of state funds and how we treat those who have different needs, and we all have very different needs. This has been a, um, apologies, I'm in my office if you hear other people, uh, this has been uh, a really common and very robust thread throughout this colloquium, right, this, like, the anxiety around preserving the integrity of the family unit. Um, from book bans to, you know, <clears throat> eugenics. And I find it interesting that, well, I found a lot of things interesting and compelling and, and grim, but the idea of the hereditary health courts, it almost seemed like a pantomime of justice or, you know, just being able to vet and hear from, you know, um, imminent victimization and then for it to be 95% determined to be sterilized, it seems like it was giving this this superficial, like this facade of, you know, we are uh, justifiably hearing out everyone's cases when really they already, it sounds like they've already decided on yeah. what they wanted to do with these peoples. And the, the role of the courts in that context is very interesting insofar as the, the medical practitioners that, you know, gave their stamp of approval saying this individual can be sterilized those were often the same doctors in in the government who then when it came to the matter of reparations would be the ones conducting the exams of bodily damage to determine any sort of financial compensation so it's the exact same doctors who denied these these claims with alarming frequency um and even those who had been sterilized who then sought to have the procedure reversed if possible um they would have to prove that they didn't suffer from the condition that they were first said to have. So if someone were sterilized for being manic depressive and they wanted to appeal that after the war, they would have to prove that they were in fact not manic depressive. And a large part of this had to do not only with Germany not being able to come to terms with what it had done, but it often referenced the United States. So in Nuremberg, the, the matter of routine sterilizations that weren't experimental um, never gained any traction because the U.S. had such a robust sterilization program. And even a certain Scandinavian countries did as well. And so we were the benchmark for them attempting to excuse this long history of eugenic sterilization. I think it really highlights too that, you know, um, most people, I think, would like to or view the um, view medicine as a hard science, but it is still its own body of discourse. Um, given the space and time, right? And and I think, and I really liked your nuanced um, presentation of, you know, the history of eugenics in the United States. And even your mention of like, you know, how anti-vaxxers have co-opted the, the word. And, um, but, you know, just even thinking about the COVID vaccine um, and it was mostly people of color who were really um, skeptical and hesitant um, of what this vaccine could do to their body. So it's such a complicated history. Absolutely. Um, sounds like, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to go to the q and I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a question that comes in here about um, eugenics and authoritarian governments and the relationship between the two, particularly in the contemporary moments. Um, do we see any parallels um, between, let's say, author authoritarian governments now? Um, although it was interesting because you also brought up the current state of eugenics and sterilization in the United States. So um, I think there's maybe some wiggle room in that question as well, but perhaps um, just to throw that out to you. Um, 
I think the key defining characteristic of authoritarian governments, right, is the reach into the the public and the private into both. And so it's pretty ubiquitous. And so matters that are perceived as being personal choices then become open to public intervention by the state. Um, it's it's interesting that some definitions of genocide include, well, um, all of them include sterilization, but um, some of them also include forcible birth. Mm-hmm. And so it also raises questions about certain political moments in the U.S. when it comes to Roe v. Wade about um, how we can conceptualize this. Um, Dorothy Roberts, uh, for sure, um, has openly spoken against Clarence Thomas and and said that, in fact, by refusing women the ability to obtain an abortion, that is more akin, if we are even to make comparisons to eugenics, than um, abortion. Yeah, that's actually a question that uh, just popped into the chat, too, actually, about um, the the role of eugenic versus forced birth um, in the current abortion discourse that we have in this country. Absolutely. Oh, interesting, too. A question about, um, uh, would you agree that the anti-abortionist is getting the government support to ensure surplus of bodies to send to war uh, against uh, other nations? Well, that's a wonderful question. I think... Because um, that's labor, right? That's yeah. productive labor. It's yeah, state. absolutely. It seems like whenever there is um, uh, conflict, right, there's it's it's interesting that right now we have um, a shortage of labor, right? There's a lot of uh, jobs and positions that aren't filled. And it seems at the same time that this rhetoric circulates is the same time in which Roe v. Wade is overturned. And so there's some certain dovetailing happening, I think, too, with war and the U.S. as this kind of U.S. imperial corporate war machine um, and how that dovetails with the, you know, supposed low employment um, and also this overturn of Roe v. Wade. But I think especially in times of war and conflict, we always see reproductive politics surfacing and the topic of reproduction, you know, popping its head up once more. So I feel like it's very much so a product of, of this very current moment. No, I find it interesting that um, the mainstream discourse around um, autonomy and reproductive autonomy doesn't kind of go in this direction at all, even though there's so much wealth of of, of history and so much uh, data that uh, can be brought up into this conversation. And I think maybe it it has to do with the question of accountability of around history and around uh, not just, you know, kind of this like atavistic past, right? But like we're talking about, like, as you said, things in ice camps and stuff like that. So. And another dimension, which I didn't mention in this presentation is um, in the context of um, uh, substance disorders, substance use disorders. So for instance, project prevention, um, a, a woman, Bar- I think Barbara Harris, who travels the country in a small RV, who pays women who um, have substance abuse issues um, money to become sterilized. And so that has gained traction. I mean, she generally receives four or 500,000 a year in donations from the U.S. alone, um, promoting the sterilization of those who use certain substances or, or struggle with addiction. So, and that's also a, a you know a, a product of this moment in which um, opi- opioids have um, really challenged people's realities. We'll say that's brand new information to me. So uh, I'm sure it is to a lot of people in this uh, Zoom right now. So, Dr. Alvis, what? Okay, so this is not a question on the chat, but something I've been thinking about. I just it just seems that this, this promotion or this campaign to build a robust nation through reproduction is, is undermined, right, by the eugenics, by the negative eugenics in the sense that, you know, it's historically what these, what kinds of peoples that these operate, I mean, that these, uh, these uh, uh, procedures have been performed upon. Um, and it just, it's not, it's not the family, but it's certain kinds of families that are okay. valued for the nation. Yeah, it's it's interesting because I think right now in this political moment with Roe v. Wade overturned, it's um, 
it looks differently in different communities because I think by denying um, women or those with uteruses the ability to receive an abortion, um, it's promoting reproduction across the spectrum. Um, but there's definitely something to be said for the way that it promotes um, certain desirable births of, say, white middle class affluent families, but really continues to create a, a labor, a workforce for the U.S. Um, and other marginalized communities. And the stance is, you know, really, if if someone wants to receive this, they can pay for it themselves. Or if they'd like to do it illegally, then that's not, um, it's not of consequence. Um, I think that returns to that question of one of the uh, dimensions for qualifying for this forced sterilization was being asocial to some degree, obviously a term that's defined by whatever um, state or institution is in power. Um, so again, um, thinking about uh, reproductive freedom and how it is targeted uh, to create certain uh, communities that are beneficial to the state. Yeah. And even now there are some um sexual offenders in certain states who are offered lower terms um, in carceral facilities if they undergo sterilization. It's it's meant to curb sexual appeal from what they say, but um, certain states are now having difficulty finding doctors that will perform the procedure, which is a good thing. Is there kickback or pushback from the medical community? I think so. It's, it's interesting because the... Um, the sterilizations in California, there were medical practitioners on both sides of the spectrum as to whether um, sterilizations can, should be permitted to happen in prisons. Um, on the one hand, right, it's by denying women that ability, then they are losing reproductive choice. Um, but by allowing it, it raises greater questions about power dynamics and autonomy in carceral facilities, which I think... Um, Prison abolition would change that that conversation entirely and take a whole new perspective. Um, but in that dynamic, there were medical practitioners on both sides of the spectrum. So it's, um, yeah. Well, that's happening now, right? With the um, with the case of the I can't remember methotrexone, the the um, the abortifacient, right? The pill, and it's actually a, a team of doctors who are saying that they are. They cannot um, administer this medication because it goes against their principles, even though no one is telling them that they have, that they need to do it. And so you definitely, have this, again, going back to what I had mentioned before about medicine as discourse, is that you know it's it it's there are going to be disagreements um, depending on that particular scientist, medical practitioners. Um, you know, uh, personal beliefs. Um, and, you know, that can, it seems as though historically that has dripped into legislation. Um, or even like, as you said, if you mentioned before, you know, popular culture with like uh, wholesome sitcoms with fit TV families. Um, maybe we have time for one more question. I see a lot about um, uh, agency and bodies and like, so the difference yeah. between uh, forced sterilization and people wishing to have permanent birth control. Um, and so I, I think maybe we could take a moment to uh, make that distinction in this conversation. Yeah, it's um, so it's interesting is that when it comes to women who voluntarily or folks with uteruses who voluntarily want to go uh, undergo sterilization, it depending on the state, there are certain cultural practices. A lot of women, if they're under the age of 30, will be denied a sterilization, even if they have absolutely no interest in, in giving birth. Um, and in some places, they'll still ask folks, heterosexual folks, husbands, yeah. if it's permissible for them to, to undergo a sterilization. Um there's it's still riddled with <laughs> um problematic issues as to who is encouraged and discouraged from reproducing i'm seeing in the q and a in particular the question of agency when it comes to uh, people with disabilities um and to whom that choice should lie um, or with whom that choice should lie 
Um, yeah, it's I think in the in the case of Ashley X, it it became contentious because there were certain protocols that were circumvented by the family. But they stated that sterilization was not the the targeted procedure. It was an outcome of the growth attenuation. And so there were ways that they tried to kind of work their way around this question of consent. Um, but the state contended it's it's their job to have a representative to act in her best interest and in Ashley's best interest. Um, and it was it was curious that they also, which was not mentioned here, um, performed, um, they removed both of her breasts. They gave her a double mastectomy and there was no real reason but they said that it would um, it would align her body with her mental age and that, you know, essentially she wouldn't be giving birth anyways. But if we if we posit keeping a body intact only for its reproductive abilities, that's a very dangerous slope. And also the question of uh, sexuality and disability and the kind of erasure of sexuality um, that is assumed, but not necessarily factual. Um, and I think something that uh, disability studies uh, in investigates very seriously. Oh, absolutely. The the asexualization of folks with disabilities, even the even media is slowly coming to represent folks with disabilities with more complexity, including sexuality. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and assistive technologies for sex. Rather than infantilizing and assuming, right, like erasing, erasing the hum humanity. Um, yeah diverse forms of bodies and identities. Absolutely. I mean, these are wonderful questions in the chat. Um, I was trying to kind of clump them together to make sure that like the theme of all of them got uh, addressed. Um, Dr. Atik, I think we have one minute left. Yeah, Just is there anything <laughs> that, that you, I know I wanna keep going, but obviously uh, we are out of time. Um, Please yeah. feel free to keep going. Just if yeah. you wanna go for a few more minutes, absolutely. It's a wonderful <laughs> conversation. I want to respect everyone's time and wrap up here, but I think the last question I saw come in was just about uh, personal prejudices um, and how it, mm -hmm. I think, again, Dr. Alves and you all brought this up about um, how medicine is fluid, how discourse, you know, the, the kind of neutrality of medicine mm -hmm. is the myth. Um, and so this last question I see here, their forms of medicine during the time seem more like the year during the, the time, which I think means all the times, um, seem more like using their own personal prejudices against people that they disliked rather than more so quote unquote real medicine. Is that true? And I think the question of real medicine um, or medicine in practice um, maybe is the pivot point in this question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that also the, um, the, the questions that science and medicine ask when they undergo studies, the, the questions that you posit on which you 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 know do an experiment or do research that in it in and of itself is, is telling of the time and the moment right science is no um although it can be done objectively um as a whole it is not objective right it's it still only lends certain things visible and documentable to us as humans um but as to the the point of medical researchers i think you know it should be much more encouraged for folks who enter the medical field to have to be informed of these histories that especially continue to impact us. I think um, most folks here are, are well aware of the higher maternal fetal fatality rate for Black women in hospitals and that their pain is not believed in that as a, a byproduct of slavery and colonialism and how women's bodies, black women's bodies have been experimented on and that persists in medicine. And so um, this is a good reason why the humanity should be paired with medicine. Um, so people have these histories and are familiar with them, um, which is why we should also save the humanities <laughs> and pair them with medicine and science. That is a beautiful note. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank First you. Of all, everyone who's here, everyone who participated in the Q&A, everyone who just zoomed in and spent their time with us today, and to you, Professor Mesnick, um, I really appreciate everything that you offered us today. I know I learned a lot, um, and I believe everybody else here did as well. So thank, thank you. All. Thank you. Thank you so much, and thank you for every everyone for attending and the sponsors. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. On behalf of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center, we appreciate you all being here today. Thanks to Tiara, Dr. Atik, and Dr. Alves. We'll see you soon.